Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. This is Irvin Gloria. And um, Irving Gloria, as we would say in the U.S., they uh, lived the American dream for more than half a century. They were children of immigrants raised during the Great Depression. And um, they started dating when they were 14. You know, so they were high school sweethearts. And Irv volunteered to be a World War II naval pilot. And Gloria said, great, I'm coming with. And she went off to training camp with him. Uh, when they came home, Irv built his own house, actually with his own hands, and he started a business that thrived for decades, and they worked there together, uh, raising their family and, and doing quite well for themselves. But at the age of 67, uh, Irv passed away. He died from prostate cancer. And Gloria was never the same after Irv passed away. She spent the rest of her days fixated on her past with Irv, um, and yet, at the same time, her memory was actually slipping away more and more uh, every day, every year. Her personality changed quite a bit. She went from being someone who was charming and witty to someone who was inattentive and, and even mean. And so her family and friends, they tried to understand her dramatic transformation. The doctors tried to understand the changes that had happened, and none of them were ever able to identify a physical cause. For Gloria, the cause of these changes uh, was completely clear to her. According to her, she was dying from the pain of a broken heart. Um, and I know this because Gloria told me every chance she got because Gloria was my grandmother. Um, so she would say this every time we had family occasions. And when we hear this story, I think that we can think, well, was she right or not? No, I, I'm not sure. But I think it should lead us to wonder about the role that pain has in each of our lives, the sort of surprising role that it has. If I ask any of you probably to think about the most painful memories and experiences you've had, you'd probably list the death of a loved one or the end of some relationship before a broken leg or a sprained ankle or something like that. And yet, when you hear my grandmother's story, where she talks about the pain of a broken heart, you probably think the pain is metaphorical. Okay, so a broken leg, that causes real pain, and social pain, the pain that comes from loss or rejection, maybe not so much. So about a decade ago, Naomi Eisenberger and I set out to test whether social pain is more than just a metaphor. And we asked people to lay in uh, an MRI scanner, so we were taking pictures of their brain, while they played what they thought was a um, simple ball tossing game with two other people that they thought were also <laughs> in scanners. And if you were in the game, you'd control this little hand at the bottom of the screen. And whenever the ball came to you, you would simply press a button to decide who the ball was going to go to next. Really boring stuff. Not a very exciting game. But then something interesting happens. Uh, the other two players who were actually controlling stopped throwing you the ball forever. You never get the ball again for the rest of the game. And, uh, and what we found was sort of two things that we thought were pretty fascinating when we looked at the brains of these individuals. So uh, when we looked and looked at what was going on when these folks were being rejected, we saw that the same brain regions that register the distress of physical pain, how much you're sort of bothered by some physical pain experience, were also more active when people were left out of the game compared to when they had been included. Moreover, the more an individual told us they felt bad about being left out of the game, so the more social distress they experienced, the more uh, these responses were sort of amplified in those particular individuals. And if that doesn't persuade you that social pain is real pain, and I know it won't for all of you, consider this. Uh, what we in the U.S. call Tylenol, what you call paracetamol here, makes these effects go away. So you can give people paracetamol, and it will actually make these social pain effects go away in terms of people's experience and also in terms of the neural responses that we see. So the same painkiller that you take for your headache can help with your heartache as well. And I think this leads, I think, pretty clearly to the conclusion that social pain is real pain. So it's not that a broken heart is the same as a broken leg, but we also don't think a stomach ache is the same as arthritis. 
there's different kinds of pain. We think of lots of different kinds of pain. And I think that this data suggests that social pain should be awarded membership in the pain club. Okay. So the next question is, why would we be built this way? Okay. When you think about it, at first blush, the fact that social pain can be so distressing and derail us for days or weeks on end um, kind of seems like a major evolutionary snafu, a misstep. Okay. But just like other kinds of pain, if we didn't have social pain, we would be absolutely lost. So we may not like how it feels, but it's critical to our well-being in the long run. If I were to take a poll of everyone here and ask you, what do you need to survive? What do people need to survive? The sort of standard top three answers on the board tend to be food, water, shelter. There's a couple others that are sort of in the same category, but these are the things we need to go get for ourselves in order to survive on a regular basis. And about 50 years ago, Abraham Maslow, the psychologist, codified this in his hierarchy of needs. And, uh, and he said that, you know, these physical needs, they're the most basic foundational needs, and that these other ones, like social needs and meaning, those only become relevant when you've taken care of the physical needs. They're the basic ones. But I think Maslow had it wrong, because we're mammals. Everyone in this room is a mammal, and if you're a mammal, the thing you need most of all for survival is social connection. And that sounds kind of crazy, but you would not have gotten to sit in these chairs today if it weren't for social connection. Each of us only survived infancy because somebody had an urge to connect with us so strongly that every time they were separated from us, every time they heard us cry, they actually came running. They felt a distress response in themselves. They came running and helped us over and over and over again. There aren't many loud, messy things that we go towards in life but it turns out that if it's our own baby, we do. And as infants, every one of you cried when you were hungry, thirsty, or cold, but you also cried when you were simply separated from your caregiver because social separation causes pain in infants. So we might think that our tendency to feel social pain is a kind of kryptonite, a vulnerability, but our urge to connect and the pain we feel when that need is thwarted is really one of the seminal achievements of the brain that motivates us to live, work, and play together. It creates a kind of social glue. And in sort of adult life, you can have the best ideas in the world, but if you're not motivated to connect with other people and can't connect successfully with other people, nothing much will come of it. Right? You can't go building rocket ships by yourself. You need to work with other people. So rather than being a kind of kryptonite, I think of our capacity for social pain and all the benefits that can lead from that as a kind of superpower. Okay. So that's superpower number one. The second superpower starts with a child's game. How many of you at some point in your life played rock, paper, scissors? Right. Good. It's a standard thing. Two people simultaneously throw one of three gestures to see who wins. So uh, we know that rock beats scissors, uh, scissors beats paper, and for some mysterious reason, paper is capable of beating rock. Um, and this seems like a reasonable way to settle a minor dispute uh, because neither person knows what the other will throw, so the outcome should be essentially random. It should be fair, okay? except it isn't fair at all. And this is because rock, paper, scissor novices, which I assume all of us probably are, um, we have a variety of tendencies that more experienced players can exploit. So for instance, inexperienced male players, like myself, have an increased likelihood of starting with rock, okay? Because rock is implicitly associated with power. That guy was my governor, okay? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you know somebody's gonna throw rock, then you can throw paper and have a much better chance of winning. Now, in 2006, this guy, British guy, Bob Cooper, emerged victorious over 500 other competitors to be crowned rock, paper, scissors world champion. And that is a thing. That is a real thing. Um, and these people spend way too much of their real time playing rock, paper, scissors. And he's totally the real deal. The next year, he came an eighth out of 500 people. This isn't random. Uh, he was challenged by a math professor. I believe it was a UK math professor to a series of rock, paper, scissors duels. 
Um, and the math professor had an amazing strategy for beating him, or at least ensuring he wouldn't lose to him on a regular basis. The math professor chose his sequence of throws based on the digits of pi. Bob Cooper cleaned his clock, okay? He won virtually every round, so he's the real deal. And after he was crowned king, after he became world champion, he gave an interview where he said that the secret is that it's about predicting what your opponent predicts you'll throw. So it's about manipulating what your opponent thinks you'll throw and then being able to sort of get inside their head and divine whether or not you've been successful in misdirecting them. He said he grew the beard before the finals so that he would look like a tough guy who would throw rock a whole lot and then said, how often did you see me throwing rock in the final? Not very often. So Cooper has this amazing talent for uh, reading minds. But what I would argue is, is that we all have an amazing talent for reading minds. Every day, on a regular basis, we read other people's minds countless times. I'll just give you one sort of silly example. Imagine that I had come up on stage, um, followed by someone, not Sarah, but followed by someone holding a gun to my head. And I then proceed to say, Justin Bieber is the greatest musical talent of this or any other generation. Okay, I'm hoping most of you would have quickly moved from the visible signs, the gun, my gender, my age, to the invisible, my thoughts and feelings, my fear of being shot if I don't do as I've clearly been instructed to do. Okay. So our mind reading abilities are not perfect, far from it. But I think it's extraordinary that we can do this at all because none of us have ever seen a thought or feeling. So the fact that we can peer into the minds of those around us and imagine their responses to practically any situation gives us an unparalleled capacity for cooperation and collaboration. It also allows us to do nefarious stuff too, but it also, I think initially, allows us as a species to collaborate in unprecedented ways. And I think this makes it clearly another one of our social superpowers. Now when you hear about this, you might assume that uh, this is just another application of our general ability to sort of think and reason analytically. Because it doesn't feel that differently. Okay. But if you think this, it turns out that you're mistaken, as, as many of us were before the neuroscience started being done. Um, if you look into the brain, you'll find out that there are these regions here on the outer surface of the brain that are used for virtually any kind of analytical thinking we do. Logical reasoning, solving math problems, holding a phone number in mind where while you go sort of rooting around for your smartphone to enter it in and call someone. And then there's this other network, more on the midline of the brain, but also somewhat on the lateral parts as well. And this network is really just for social thinking, for mind reading, or what's sometimes referred to as mentalizing. One of the best known things about this network is that the other kinds of thinking tend to turn off the kinds of processes associated with this. So this is associated with social thinking. When you engage in analytical thinking, this network tends to go quiet. So it's a little bit like these two networks are on a neural seesaw. And when activity in one goes up, the activity in the other tends to quiet down. We also know that this network for social thinking tends to come on like a reflex. So whenever you finish doing some kind of analytical thinking, the instant you finish doing it, this network just spontaneously pops up. Well, what is that doing for us? Well, if, let's say, in a moment from now, I asked you to do some kind of mind-reading task, try to think about what the person next to you is thinking as they hear me, or something like that, something trivial. I asked you to do that in a minute from now. Well, right now, before I've asked you, the more this network spontaneously pops up, preemptively comes on, it makes you more likely to do well at that mind reading task a minute from now. So, just as seeing this word makes you more likely to see this illusion as two faces rather than as a vase, okay, this network for social thinking coming on preemptively before you walk into the next moment of your life, the next situation that you're dealing with, makes you more likely to see the actions around you in terms of the minds behind them, in terms of the psychological processes that are motivating those actions. And finally, okay, this network 
also comes on when we're taking in new information. So my lab has uh, done research where uh, we show people promos for upcoming movies, what we call trailers in the US. And when you watch those trailers, the more this network pops up, the more likely you'll be to later go get on Facebook and tell your friends about it. Okay? So this network sort of switches us from a mode of being sort of selfish information consumers to being information DJs where we're actually motivated to sort of spread what we learn and share it with others. And this motivation is clearly something that's really, really important for the success of our species. If these are our superpowers, then the sort of big question remaining is, well, what's our kryptonite? Okay? And the answer is pretty simple. Our kryptonite is that we don't appreciate the value of our social superpowers in our everyday life. We don't realize how important social is in general, and when we do realize, we tend to forget again pretty easily. We might have moments of clarity about this. If I'm lucky, some of you will have that reaction today. Um, and then, you know, we sort of go back about our lives and sort of forget about this. And so we've thought about how you can apply these superpowers or how we fail to apply these superpowers in various contexts. But one that's, I think, interesting to think about is clearly education. This is, I think, especially a problem in the U.S. When our kids hit puberty in the U.S., the vast majority of them really lose educational engagement. They stop being motivated to learn for learning's sake. Um, I think this has a lot to do with puberty and how puberty is reorienting the brain. Um, obviously, the material is getting harder as well. But we have these surveys, international surveys, where they ask the kids in all these different countries, how socially connected and socially safe do you feel in your school? And uh, the U.S. score is dead last. So our 13 and 14 year olds do not feel socially connected um, at all. Okay? Uh, England, you guys do a lot better than we do, but to be honest, you're no Lithuania. Um, so, you know, you still have room to grow in terms of, of this measure. And I know this is true in England as much as it's true uh, in the U.S. Bullying among this age group is a huge, huge issue. So when we think about bullying, I think it's natural to think about the mental health consequences. So we know that it leads to depression and anxiety and so on. But if you're being bullied at lunchtime or after school, what does that have to do with how well you learn English or math when you're sitting in the classroom? Does it actually have a direct impact on learning, right? It seems like, well, you should be able to just put that aside and get back to learning. But if you take social pain seriously, and I do take this idea seriously, it's a little bit like saying, well, we know you just got cut really badly with a knife, but just sit down and learn your lesson, right? We wouldn't expect someone to do that, but if someone has been bullied, then we think, well, you should be able to put that aside. I think it's because we have a, a poor theory of what bullying does to us and what it's doing to our brain. So when someone is getting bullied on the playground, you can bet it's having real consequences for how they can focus and learn once they're back in the classroom. The second thing I sort of want to focus on with respect to education is that when we're in the classroom itself, we tend to think of being social as kind of the enemy of learning. Okay? But it turns out that being social may be learning's best friend. Okay? So if you learn in order to teach someone else, you actually learn the material better than if you learn in order to take a test. And this is true even if you never get to teach someone else. So we know that when we uh, actually go through the act of teaching someone else, we get to sort of consolidate the information. In the studies that have been done that I think are most interesting here, you read a passage either thinking you'll take a test or that you will teach someone else about. And either way, when you finish the passage, you get the test. And the people who have no idea the test is coming and only read it in order to teach someone else do better on the test because they took the information in differently. And there's some hints from data that um, Jason Mitchell at Harvard collected and I've collected in my own lab that suggests that when you're taking in information with a social motivation to share it, remember I told you about the information DJ idea? Different brain systems are being invoked to do the learning than the normal memorization analytical network. And we see the sort of social brain network, this mentalizing or mind reading network, coming on when people are trying to learn for a social reason, and it's associated with better learning outcomes. But because of that neural seesaw thing, when we sit in classrooms and we try to memorize, we're actually shutting this system off, this system that may be an exceptional learner, 
we're quieting it down. It turns out this idea of learning for teaching was implemented in one country at a broad national level. In France, after the French Revolution, there was such a massive teacher shortage that they actually recruited children to teach other children. And it turned out to be wildly successful. But once France got back on its feet, it said, eh, forget about that, let's go back to the normal classroom. So while they had done this kind of by accident or by default, they hadn't appreciated the value of this social process, and then they went back to the age-old idea of a single teacher standing in front of the classroom to talking to 25, 30 kids is the way to teach. Is peer tutoring usually is, oh, well, we'll take two 14-year-olds and we'll have the smart one teach the less smart one. Okay, that, I think, doesn't work the best way it could. From my view, what you do is the kid who's having the most trouble is the kid that you want to be teaching someone who is at a level where they can actually do something useful. Because it's the teaching process that I think engages a lot of these social motivations that are going to help out uh, in the end. And so it's sort of a changing who's in the teaching role because we're focused on teaching as the learning mechanism. So we call that learning for teaching and that's work we're doing now. So when I think about this, I think, okay, well, if our kids really learned about the social superpowers they have from a very young age, if they had a class on the social brain and the social mind, and they got this in as an intuition from a very young age, maybe that kryptonite would go away a bit. Maybe we'd be better uh, in that realm. And so you might not be able to explain to your kids why they need to learn algebra. I'm not sure there's a good answer to that. But there's no question that if they learn about these social superpowers uh, and they learn how to strengthen these social superpowers, it's going to help them, I think, for their entire lives. If mentalizing is so important for learning, which I completely agree it is, it's a, it's a critical aspect of our everyday lives, including learning. How do you incorporate it into the curriculum? How can you change the curriculum and yeah. pedagogy to incorporate mentalizing? Yeah, no, so I, I think that... Uh, we have the same issue in the United States. It's all been trial and error, and just recently we have this new Institute for Educational Science where they're trying to do these randomized control studies and funding people to do that. I think it's essential. Like everything else we've done with science to sort of test all our assumptions, and most of them are going to be wrong, and a few of them will be surprisingly right or wrong in interesting ways. And so I think the most important thing is to try lots of things and find out what the data tells us instead of just trying to think we, we know everything. Depending on the subject, I think you can incorporate mentalizing in different ways. So I think when it comes to math and science, they are not intrinsically mentalizing friendly subjects. Um, and I think that's where this sort of peer tutoring idea with the sort of more senior person teaching someone who's a bit more junior works. It takes more time to do that, but given that we only remember about a third of the content we learn three months later, I'm okay with cutting down the amount we learn, focusing on the stuff that's most important and learning it the right way. For non-math and science, for history and English, I think there are ways to make it dramatically more mentalizing friendly. So in my history classes, and this is weird because I'm from the US, we spent all our time studying Europe when I was growing up. We, and what we studied was the map of Europe and who fought who and when the boundaries changed and what the wars looked like. It was very much about the sort of behavioral outcomes of what happened. And we never discussed the minds of the people who were moving things around. But if you take sort of what's going on in the news in any given moment, so in the US right now, we're really focused on, you know, Syria and Putin and, you know, what are their motives? You know, what is Assad and Putin really trying to do? What's their backroom deal or not about the chemical weapons? It's all about mentalizing, and that's part of what makes it intriguing to us. There's a drama about minds, and that's what we love to absorb. So I think that history should be taught more from that perspective along with the facts sort of take into account. So what kind of motives would have led Napoleon or whoever to engage in these behaviors? And I think that'll get kids a lot more engaged in the, the additional factual, factual material as well.